How's everybody doing? Good, I assume. Uh, I'm going to continue in our topic of the new and living way. The new and living way, which we've been speaking about for the last few weeks. And um, uh, Minu spoke about the topic within that overall theme, which was the topic of new families. As you all hopefully remember, uh, from this topic, we've been talking about how God has saved us from sin and destruction and uh, made a new covenant with us, uh, gave, a, uh, new, gave us a new heart, right? And we've been talking about how we have been placed in new families. And we talked about how... Um, uh, the importance of the family uh, structure within the church. Um, we've uh, spent some time talking about kind of how we should interact with each other, as Justin spoke about that. Um, and then last week, Minu really kind of emphasized uh, the uh, aspect that when we say new families, that it is an expanded definition to include the overall church. Okay? So, new family is not just contained to our own little nuclear family, which we, as we sp spoke about that as well, is the building block of, of, uh, of the church and the community, but, but it is not contained within the small family unit we have, right? So that's why, as Minu said, I uh, even called it uh, the Kurishimutal family, right? So we all belong. That is our new family name. It's the family at the cross, at the foot of the cross. So that unites us together so that we now live not for ourselves, but for each other in Christ. Uh, so continuing on this topic, I really want to look further into this aspect of living as a new family with each other uh, within the church. Uh, I'm going to read a little passage uh, from, that is familiar to us. John chapter 7, verse 38. John 7, verse 38. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So, this is a familiar passage to us, kind of talks about as we, once we become believers in Christ, that from us and through us flows the things of God, the Holy Spirit works through us, right? Issues forth from us as living waters, and but we have to think about, okay, now what does that mean? Where is that water going? Where is it coming from? Why, how do I fit in? So the way I thought about it, like how does it all fit in to the topic of the new family, right? And so the way I thought about it is I had to think back into uh, a previous part of my career. I worked for a pipeline company. And so I used, I brought a little thing to illustrate. So a pipeline is simply what you call a conduit. You all heard of a conduit? It's something that flows, whether it's oil, gas, water, um, lots of things, yeah, yeah, um, lots of things are transported by pipelines. Okay, so it is simply, what, a cylinder that you flow through the pipeline, right? And so when I think about us, as Christians, we are a conduit or a pipeline for God to flow through us to others, to the uh, broader church, to the community. And, and this is how God intends for the rivers of living water to flow from us. Okay? But now it's not very simple. Because I can't just be a pipe. We can go to Home Depot and buy, you know, uh, different diameters of pipeline and just 
can stick it in your house. It's you completely useless, right? So if you if so from from my time in uh, in that industry, um, I had the chance to work on very large projects that connected you know hundreds of miles uh, uh, together through uh, networks of pipeline. Right, we bought and sold uh, pipeline networks. We constructed hundreds and thousands of miles of pipeline of various diameters. Some pipelines are even bigger than me, right, in diameter, but they're all under the ground. Okay, so, and if you think about how this country functions uh, without even us knowing, when you go to fill gas in your, uh, in your tank, you should know that it got there through an extensive pipeline network that traverses the country. Or when you turn uh, your stove on to cook something, the natural gas got there through an extensive pipeline network. It did not happen through just individual pipelines just laid out here and there. What happened? It was through pipelines that were connected together. Yes? Otherwise, no gas or oil or gasoline or diesel will flow through and get to its end point. Seems natural, um, seems obvious, correct? Yes? So, the same way God, when He envisions His family, He envisions us as an interconnected network of conduits or pipelines that will allow Him to flow His Spirit in His life that can be used from uh, one conduit to other to pour life into others, into areas that, you know, would ne was never reached before, right? And so whether that is in your family, little family context, so think of yourself as conduits, as parents, uh, flowing the principles of God, the, uh, the Spirit of God, the life of God into your children, through you, God has put you as a conduit in your family. So no pipeline ever said, no, I don't want to... I just want to be a pipeline. I don't want anything to flow through me. That's not what a pipeline is. They're built to be conduits. We were made to be conduits. Same way in the church. We were made to be conduits for a blessing to others in our community. And I'm not restricting that to Hebron, right? Uh, yes, we have to be responsible to our local you know, church, but where when we think about the church, we're talking about being conduits to the body of Christ in our community or across the world, wherever, however God uses us. But the first thing the, the conduit has to realize is that it is a conduit, right? If the pipe thinks that it's something else, but merely the means by which God transfers his treasures to other people, then the, it won't function effectively. Right? You all with me? So same way, and if you think about it, I am not just talking about, you know, one lifetime. Think about it from generation to generation. Think about how the Israelites were instructed by God to pass on His laws, right? They said you should instruct. Instruct them when you're sitting down, standing up. They should know the word of God at all moments of their life. When you sit around your table, when you uh, walk with them, when you talk to them, always pass on. They were instructed to be conduits or channels or pipelines of God's laws and principles to be passed on from generation to generation. That's why even many generations later, the Israelites knew what God did for their father Abraham. Amen. Or God did for Moses. Or, or through Moses, through Joshua, all the great men of God. God did all those things. And that information was preserved because people were willing to be conduits to pass on the legacy or the wealth or the treasure of God to the next generation. So now the question we have to ask ourselves is, as I think about myself in my family, in my church, local church, in my, uh, in my behavior in the community, am I being a conduit or a pipeline? Am I connected to the network of God's family? 
Or am I just sitting on the shelf at Home Depot? Is God flowing through you, out of your belly, the living waters for the blessing of other people? Or do we come to church to merely consume? Right? To merely participate. But are we here for God to flow through us? You all with me? So, and hopefully we'll cover more of this, what all it involves, but just hitting... <clears throat> A couple of things. So if you'll notice, I mean, it's a very simple thing. But for this pipeline to be connected to receive something, it has to be joined to another pipeline, right? That's right. Do you know how that happens? It's something called, so if it's a stainless steel pipe, you weld it together, right? Through intense heat and, uh, and, tem uh, and temperature, it's, the metals are fused together so that it can receive and there is no leak of the thing you're trying to transport. Yes? So for us to be a conduit, we have to be connected to each other. We have to be ready to receive. We can't pour out unless you're ready to receive. You all with me? So whether that starts at being ready to receive the word of God that is spoken here or when we come together. That's the first, right? If we're not ready to receive the word of God, no matter who's speaking, no matter where you're at, if the word of God is being spoken, if we reject it, we're not connected or welded together to the network of God. This is how God works. God doesn't, you know, God works through his servants speaking the word of God. You all with me? And then we also had to be connected to other men and women of God who've gone before us. Who have the maturity and the, and the, and the gray hair um, or, or uh, uh, the leadership who want to pour into your life. But sometimes we don't want that. We don't want to allow other people to instruct us because we don't think they know who we are. And how, how would they understand what I am going through? What do they care about me? But we have to give this a chance. So no pipeline can be used as a conduit unless you're connected to the network, to, uh, to the people of God. This is how a new family functions. This is the family that God envisioned and God can do great things. If you think about it, uh, like the Colonial Pipeline is one of the largest pipeline networks in the country. It, uh, it transports all the way from in the northeast corner of the U.S. in New York, or even north of that, all the way down to the Gulf Coast. Imagine thousands and thousands of miles of pipe, and the same gasoline that you put up there is what ends up in the other side. This happens through this amazing engineering work. But this works in the kingdom of God. For us to pass on this faith to the next generation, this is so important for us to be a conduit. To allow ourselves to be discipled. To allow ourselves to receive. Okay, so now that's the first half. The second half is a pipeline has to be willing to pour out. Yes? has to allow itself to flow through it the treasures that need to flow through it. But sometimes what happens is when you go from a big diameter pipe to a smaller diameter pipe, you need a step down in the pressure. Right? You can't just force a thousand pound uh, gas, uh, natural gas into a small little pipe. What will happen? It will burst open. So just because you've done it and seen that, been all that in your life, and you've conquered it, you can't shove down the throat of the younger person that you think you've learned. You all with me? And sometimes we take this brutal approach of not understanding where somebody is coming from and force our viewpoint on somebody without understanding what is needed of us. So just because we are a conduit does not mean that we control how the flow works. You all with me? So we have to understand, 
okay, how do I need to meter this? Do I need to restrict the flow? And do I, need, do I know what kind of product this second pipeline can take, right? Maybe it's, it can only handle crude oil, but you're trying to send natural gas. It doesn't work. So the same way God's wisdom works through us, but we have to allow ourselves to work in the way he wants to work us. But it requires that submission and surrender to authority. Uh, submission and desire to pour out. And God will use us to connect us to people around us. You all with me? And this is, um, this is so important to the functioning, successful functioning of the new families that we're talking about. This is so important. We cannot, we cannot just come here and individually consume and go back. And, and we have to be ready to pour out into each, everybody, each other. That's the only way that we can all grow together into the spiritual maturity that Christ desires. Okay, so the, <clears throat> the example I thought of uh, was King Hezekiah. And I'm not going to read the passages, but you can read about him in Isaiah 37 through 39, 2 Kings 18 to 20, and 2 Chronicles 29 to 32. So he's a famous king. We hear different messages about him. But I thought of uh, an aspect of his life uh, to kind of bring home this point. Not uh, and only saw later, he was actually a genius. He, in fact, put a conduit or a pipeline to bring water down to the city from a river up north. Um, so I was like, oh, wow, this is the perfect example. Fits in right well with what I was trying to say. So, so anyway, so Hezekiah was king when he was 25 years old. And he were ruled for 14 years and did wonderful things. His father was an evil man, but he himself was a great king. He did what was right in the eyes of God. And he, he, um, uh, he brought, tore down the idols. He uh, restored people to worshiping God. And he you know, went back, brought Israel back to the fear of God. And he did all these wonderful things. And he even stood up to the Assyrian Empire and, and through uh, his trust, complete trust in God, God destroyed them through the hands of an angel. Right, uh, 185,000 soldiers were killed in their sleep. And we all know the story. So Hezekiah did these exploits during the first half of his kingdom. And then it says, and if you read Chronicles, each uh, description of it says a different angle. So the first... Uh, so then uh, Chronicle says that he became very proud towards the end of that first half. And he did not give back to God what was due according to how God had blessed him. And he became very proud and God struck him down with his disease. And he became ill and he was about to die. And then there was this miracle that happened. He cried out to God and Isaiah came and prayed for him. And he said, your life has been extended another 15 years. Okay, we all know the story. So, now think about somebody's uh, mindset that you know you have 15 years. You know it's not going to be any less than that. It won't be any more than that. Right? So he, his second half of the reign, there's not a whole lot of description, but he went away from God in that, in that time is my belief. So first thing um, he did was he, uh, there were uh, the spies or ambassadors from this little old empire called Babylon who came uh, to see what all, you know, is the wealth of Judah. So he invited them in and showed them all of the wealth that he had accumulated. Every single thing. Isaiah 39 says that he did not, there was nothing that Hezekiah did not show the, the people from Babylon all the secrets of the kingdom. And God immediately saw that and he said, what? I am going to take the kingdom away from you. God was, 
going to punish him and, and even said is your sons are going to be eunuchs in the palace of, uh, in Babylon. He was punishing him even though he did such great things. The first thing you got to remember is just a little side point for to learn that is that we have to practice in this age of, you know, so social media and just open communication. Be careful to not put all your treasures out for everybody. Not everybody needs to know everything. Be careful in what you share to who. What you broadcast publicly. The devil is walking around to destroy us to see what we, he can use to crush our spirit. Right? So we have to use discretion in what we share and say and talk and what we invite into our lives. Right? Do not allow the enemy access into your life that he can use to destroy you. Yes? You all with me? So, use discretion. So, but what struck me was um, in Isaiah 39 verse 8. This is the reason why I said all of this. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. Are you kidding? It's good that your generation will be destroyed? He said moreover, for there shall be peace and truth in my days. This is what struck me. This is a king who had done great things in the first part of his kingdom. Great exploits restored Israel back on the right track. But after he had seen the wealth and reached a comfortable place in his life, he knew his life was set because he had so many years left to live, he was coasting. And and he says, okay, all this bad stuff is going to happen, but it's going to happen after my time. He was not, even though he put in a conduit for physical uh, betterment of Israel, he was not willing to be a conduit or a pipeline. He did not worry that his actions would lead to destruction in later generations. And I've heard, uh, so what happened was after his death, his son Manasseh became king. And, um, and it's, he ruled for 55 years, almost twice as long as Hezekiah did and did more damage than he reversed. Right? He was a wicked king. But he became king when he was 12. So now think about Manasseh. So I've heard people say, you know what, uh, uh, Hezekiah became, gave another 15 years, and he had Manasseh. Maybe it was better he didn't have Manasseh. That's not the way to think about it. Maybe the way to think about it is, think about the 12 years that Manasseh was alive, what did he see? He didn't see the part of his father's life where he did those great things. He saw abundance and wealth and comfort. You all with me? He saw an arrogant king who thought he can just do whatever he wants and show an enemy kingdom the wealth of Israel, of Judah. Do we think that maybe it had an influence on Manasseh? Possibly. Right? This is what I'm talking about, being a conduit. We've come, we've, God has brought us to this great country, and we talk about all the things they had to go through before we came here, right? It's our legacy, and our, for, uh, our legacy of faith. But in this, in this phase of our culture, are we being conduits of the faith that we received and the treasure that we received to channel that to the next generation, to channel the people around us? Or are we being like Hezekiah in his second half of his kingdom? Are we squandering the treasure that God been us, given us? Or are we plugged into the network of the family of God to receive instruction, to pour out life, to be under the authority of 
people who can disciple us and to pour out the Spirit of God out of our, as Jesus said, out of our belly so that the Spirit of God may flow out into those around us. Not just within our families, but into the broader family of God. Are we willing to be a conduit? This is the question that we have to ask ourselves. And I ask uh, the worship team to come, come up as we're thinking about this. This has to be the cry of our heart. What will I leave this place as? What will people know me as? Have I been a conduit for the treasures of God? And I know myself that, um, you know, even though I've walked away and sinned and, you know, walked away from God, God was gracious enough to bring me back. But I can't for one minute think that I can rely on, just like Hezekiah, the first half of my life. My kids didn't see that. So they have to see the same God that I saw in my, in my time of struggles. I have to be a conduit for the same treasure that he poured into me, into my children and, and, and those around me that, that need that wealth to be poured out into others. This is what God desires from the, the new family that we've been brought into. May his name be glorified.